Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for joining us today from all over Australia and all the way from the other side of the world. We've got um, John and Tom as well. Um, we've got the second webinar in our three part series covering trauma sensitive instruction and leadership in schools with John F. Ella and Tom Herrick. Today, we're focusing on leading a trauma sensitive school. I'm Lauren Mitchell, editor at Hawker Brownlow Education, which is based in NAM, Melbourne. I'm joining you today from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. In the spirit of reconciliation, Hawker Brownlow Education acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. For those who aren't familiar with us, um, Hawker Brownlow Education empowers uh, foundation to 12 teachers and educational professionals with the tools, skills and resources to help improve classroom performance and to raise uh, student achievement. So we have a couple of tips for today's webinar. Before we get started, uh, please use your chat box, which a lot of you have jumped into already this morning. Uh, for any technical questions, send them to the user named Hawker Brownlow Education. That's me. Um, and I will see if I can help you out in any way. You will be placed on mute during this webinar, but please feel free to type in the chat box and ensure you choose all attendees and panelists when you do so. There will also be a Q&A at the end, so please send through any questions you might have throughout this webinar through the chat box too. You are very welcome to send these questions privately to me if you would prefer to remain anonymous, of course. Finally, it's important to note that we will be covering content relating to trauma in today's webinar. Please be careful, be sure to reach out if you need help and feel free to take time out if you need it. This webinar will be available again online in 7 to 14 days so you can come back at another time if you need. If you need to get in contact with us after today, you can reach us via email at info at hbe.com.au. You can also follow HBE at all of the usual places on social media. You can find past webinars and other video resources just like this session on our YouTube channel at Hawker Brownlow Ed. As we've met before, I'll just give John Ella and Tom Herrick a very short introduction before we begin. John Ella is a former principal, director of a principal's training centre and assistant superintendent for curriculum, learning and staff development. And Tom Herrick has been an education, edu sorry, has been an educator since 1983 in roles including teacher, school leader, department of education, project leader, and executive director. So, John and Tom, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'll share my screen. Go ahead, John. I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Seashelt Nation, just on the uh, west coast of the province of British Columbia. We continue to learn from those whose territory we currently live on, spend time at, and uh, we are very fortunate that many of those uh, descendants are here to teach us as much as we are here to teach their children. So, you know, one of the things we wanted to keep in mind as we think about the impact and, and, you know, we mentioned last time, trauma didn't arrive with the pandemic. Trauma won't depart when we are post pandemic. And so one of the things that's really abundantly clear is this whole notion that we need to plan on going forward. Yeah, I've heard far too many colleagues talk about they can't wait to get back to the old normal. We wanna be clear on many levels, the world we left no longer exists. In fact, I'm not even sure I, I like the notion of the word normal. People said, well, maybe it's a new normal then. And I think that still has some constraints, some parameters to it. What we're hoping to encourage you to do, you and your teams to do, is to plan a move forward to a new better. Take the best of what we've learned during this very difficult time, add it to the best of what we knew prior to, and let's plan this move forward to a new better. Let's build off of the opportunity this time has provided us to find out some things, to find out what's essential, to find out what's missing. John and I happen to believe that social emotional learning and the impact of trauma 
are underserved in most schools and have traditionally been so. We also happen to believe that they are right there on par with reading and writing and arithmetic. If we are trying to create, facilitate functional adults who can make valuable, viable contributions to their communities. Oh, I think you went over one, John. Here we go. We also know this. All of you are in critical roles. Leaders set the tone. They develop the district, the school's culture to help students and staff be successful. We know that for many of our students, the adults they see at school are the best adults they get to hang out with. We also know that many of them have had the trauma exacerbated by the difficult situations we currently face. And so we've got to be leading and creating those cultures that promote success for all, not just success for a very few. So what we're gonna be talking about today and through all of these sessions really is built off the work that John and I created in these two books trauma-sensitive instruction, and trauma-sensitive leadership. They're companion books. A lot of what we share with you, a lot of the scenarios you're going to find replicated in these books. We're going to give you a little taste of the content, and we're pleased that Hawker Brownlow is going to make these books available. And so again, just check out those links that Lauren shared with you earlier, and you can get copies of both of these books. <clears throat> as tom mentioned this idea of trauma is not new Our, we had many students who were dealing with situations outside of school that were causing them great trouble we found this definition of trauma to be really helpful for both teachers and leaders who are interested in implementing trauma sensitive instruction and there's a couple of key words here that I think you're gonna find helpful. One is the idea of exceptional. So these are experiences that are outside of the norm, not just discomfort, but actually students who are having major issues. Powerful and dangerous. Uh, again, as we, the pandemic came upon all of us, teachers got to look into some of the students' homes and saw some of the dangers that some of our children were facing. And then finally, this idea of overwhelming their capacity to cope. So it's really important when you're thinking about this idea of trauma-sensitive instruction that you think about and come up with a, a definition. So at the last webinar, we spent much more time on these elements. So today we're gonna to be fairly brief. So in, in the education field, we really became more aware of trauma after a study that was conducted in the late 1990s. And this is the classic uh, Kaiser Permanente and Center for Disease Control study. And basically what they did is they looked at uh, several thousand adults, well-adjusted middle-income, middle-class adults, and they compared their health records with uh, some of their responses on a, on a survey. And they found that events that were traumatic that happened to them before adulthood had an adverse impact on their health. And since then, in the States, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has been conducting follow-up studies because this has become a huge problem here. And they found there's some additional elements outside of the original ACEs study that are also traumatic experience for students before they, they're adults. Things like racism, poverty, exposure to community violence, and, and one that was surprising, overly punitive school discipline. So sometimes children get in situations where they misbehave and then educators have overreacted and that's caused ad, an adverse childhood event. Again, in the last webinar, we talked about what happens when the brain is under stress. And um, as you can see here, the brain normally functions to help protect us, provide pleasure, 
it, it looks at pattern development. But during a traumatic event, uh, hormones are secreted in the brain that cause us to go to what's called the reptilian part of the brain or the cerebrum. And the diagram in the lower right-hand corner um, has a picture of, of, of a brain. And the tannish part is the more automatic part. And then the part that has color, that's where cognition, problem solving, those sorts of things happen. And so when children are under stress, when they're, when they're experiencing adverse events and they're under stress, their body naturally relies on the tan part of the brain, which is very reactionary in nature. And then the last bullet point, we talked at the last webinar about how long-term exposure to adverse events or multiple adverse events can also cause the brain to learn to operate in this manner for a long time. And then another element we uh, talked about at the last webinar related to uh, what happens uh, during the time that child is experiencing fear. And there's a, a portion of the brain called the amygdala, and that releases um, a hormone called cortisol. That's a fight or flight hormone. And it's, it's good for reacting and helping us escape danger. But what happens is when this hormone's present in the brain, learning stops for at least 20 minutes. And the interesting thing is that this cortisol can stay in our body for up to three hours. So if you have a situation with a student, they come from home and there's conflict at home or abuse at home, when they come into the school, they're still under the influence of cortisol. So again, it stops cognition for a minimum of 20 minutes and it can stay in the body for up to three hours. And trust or building a predictable environment can help deactivate the amygdala and it blocks the release of cortisol. And the impact of trauma is really hard to predict. And I'm gonna let Tom talk in a minute about this because both of us firmly believe in this, but one member of a family can have a traumatic event Another member of that same family can experience the same event and they can have different reactions. So let me turn it over to Tom. And so to follow up on that, it, it doesn't mean that someone was right or someone was wrong in their response. What might be trauma inducing, fear inducing for me might be something that is a fairly low level impact for you. Right. So what, what we've got to do is resist the urge to say, well, that's not that big a deal. Come on, get over it. Right. We know and we are seeing many, many examples. And I'm certain all of you could come up with at least as many examples as what we are seeing here of behavior in particular that has gone unchecked for a long period of time. When kids have been away from school, for example, and have not had the opportunity to learn school positive behaviors when they have been in a remote situation, we know that they are responding differently to events that maybe prior to the pandemic would have been fairly easy for them to manage. There's been a whole lot more isolation during the time of pandemic and people then have uh, not had to satisfy anybody else with their responses. Now, as we start to emerge post pandemic, we are starting to see a lot of friction happening in schools, in communities, right? So our reactions are very much a personal thing. I come from a family of eight children. I can tell you this, all of us responded differently to the circumstances we experienced. I'm not here to tell you right or wrong. I am here to tell you that I've lost four siblings based on decisions and choices they made. So if the measure is still here, then I'm willing to say that my choice has at least given me the opportunity to be here with you today. Doesn't make it better or worse. It was just the decision I made that was different than the decisions some of my siblings made. 
This is a really important aspect. When we work with schools to help them develop trauma-sensitive practices, we actually go into much more depth with this. And we have a short video that we share that illustrates how the impact of trauma goes all the way down to the chromosomal and the DNA uh, structure so that students become biologically programmed to react differently to trauma, which for teachers is really an eye-opening uh, fact. So in trauma-sensitive schools and classrooms, there are lots of uh, things that we can do to make them more focused. One is the idea of what's called the eight R's. And what I'm gonna talk about next are eight R's that deal with practice. And then we'll take a look at eight R's that deal with mindset. So first of all, it's important that we have predictable and probably common routines. Again, kids who are coming from trauma-filled uh, homes, their life is pretty unpredictable. So being able to come to school and have a predictable routine is really important. Rituals, that's another R. The rituals are routines, but they're actually more emotional in nature. So ways of maybe starting the class or welcoming uh, children to the class, or maybe ways of ending the day, they develop these emotional routines that really help the students feel a part of belonging. Relationships, uh, Tom and I really firmly believe, and we've uh, had this through our own experience, that it's relationships that are key to the success. And then finally, the idea of regulation. And regulation is where we help students develop the processes and the strategies to help them cope with and de-escalate and let go of emotions associated with trauma. And then th those are elements related to practice. And then these are elements related to mindset. So first of all, realize, and this is where the information that we just talked about when we spend time with teachers we actually help them to understand that this could be happening and, and that it's students are coming from some you know pretty pretty bad situations. Recognize that's a mindset is just being observant, not trying to draw an opinion necessarily, but just looking for what are some signs and then what are some things that seem to be triggering their responses. Teachers response or responding. That's important because if we accept the uh, students as they are, they're going to be more trusting to help us understand their situation. If we respond by making judgment or trying to you know, reshape them or fix them or whatever, then that's a problem because they're not gonna develop the relationship. And then finally, resist, which is related to respond, and that is, as educators, sometimes it's easy to be judgmental. So we want to try to resist that aspect of being judgmental to trauma. So we talked earlier about reactions to trauma. And this is the idea of the response and the resist. And obviously, when we have situations in the classroom, it's really easy to have a strong emotional response. But when emotions get heightened, it's really important that we think about how do we center ourselves and how do we understand or implement the value of calmness in processing situations. So go back to what John had shared earlier, this whole notion, uh, you know, of, of, kids coming to school, arriving to school, having gone through a traumatic or fear-inducing event, right? And then they get dropped off at school. And the teacher is just being their awesome self and greets the child with great care, caution, genuineness. And the child doesn't respond. This is really where we have to monitor our reaction. This is not the time to get upset, right? 
Again, are you saying good morning to give something of yourself or are you saying good morning to receive something? If you don't get the reaction, the response from the kid that you think, that ought to be a red flag for you that something is going on here. Now to bark at the kid or want to consequence the kid because they did not give you back the same level of enthusiasm you gave them starts to derail this. Remember now, if they've gone through a traumatic or fear-inducing event, the cortisol flushes on. They're not learning. It's taking two to three hours for the cortisol to be metabolized. This is where we need to make some choice around our reaction to that. They've come from emotion. They don't often get to see the value of calmness. They often see adults who are doing things in a positive way in order to get something, not to give something. As many of you know, when they get through the, when the student gets through the initial reaction, a lot of times they're able to rationalize and talk through the issue. But when they're under heightened emotion, they have difficulty thinking rationally. So as educators, that's why it's important for us to change our mindset and give ourselves some pause between the event and our reaction. One skill that we develop in educators when we work in schools to help schools become trauma sensitive is what's called temporary suspension of opinion. This is a mindset skill that causes us to, instead of immediately reacting, we almost have a little self-talk in our head and we say, withhold, stop, don't react, whatever it takes so that we can maintain calmness. And as it says at the bottom, this is an opportunity for us to help the sender come up with more ideas. And as you think about this, in, at times when you've talked with a student and you've hesitated to get upset and let the student work through it, a lot of times they come up with some really good choices. And there are three levels when we work with schools that we help develop. The first level is just becoming a better listener. In many cases, trauma impacted uh, students are really just looking for someone who can listen to them. This isn't happening in some of their homes. As Tom said, parents might be nice to get something or maybe parents are upset with them and they're not listening, they're, they're, they're in the high emotion. So just listening can really make students feel more comfortable. In my case, I grew up also in a trauma impacted home and my seventh grade social studies teacher just listened and I developed a really strong relationship with him. The second level that we develop is what's called the diagnostic level. This is where as an educator, as we're observing the situation and not reacting, we're trying to think about what would be the next logical step that we could implement? What's the next strategy that we might implement that we could use to deescalate the situation? And then finally, the third level is what's called the emotional level. This is where we can keep ourselves from getting emotionally overtaken so that we can rationally help think about the solution to the issue. Now, as, as easy as those words fit on one slide, I've got to tell you, this is a challenge, right? Oftentimes, particularly as we deal with leaders, you're in a position where it's easy to get into the belief that someone is coming to talk to you because they want you to solve the problem. So you're ready to solve before you've even heard fully what the problem is, right? It's difficult to avoid the emotion because you want to be seen as being supportive. And so what you need to be able to do is to be able to take that step back and not get to that the diagnostic is really that you're processing if 
you are asked, not because you're ready to jump in. And I can tell you from personal experience, it takes a while to get there. I had to work on these skills over an extended period of time. And I got to tell you, there are times I still think I am working on these skills. As Tom suggested, I also had to learn these skills and work on them. And as a leader, I found that I was modeling the calmness that I wanted my teachers to utilize with the children. And so when somebody sent a student to the office or if I saw something in the hallway, how I handled it, I was modeling for the teachers. And again, the, most of the time you, you find that the children maybe did not intend to cause a problem, but something about the situation has diminished their thinking. So again, this is a really good skill for leaders and for uh, teachers. So this slide uh, talks about changing the reaction, which we alluded to earlier with the uh, uh, eight R's. And again, this, uh, this sentence at the bottom is really strong. Many times we approach a situation trying to problem solve it. And we might ask what's wrong when in fact, we're already drawing the judgment that something's wrong. Maybe by just shifting to the question of what happened, that is a much more objective way to approach the situation. Again, as Tom and I both have been discussing, these kinds of skills require a mindset change in all of us. The ability to step back temporarily and think about how you're gonna approach it, that's a mindset change for many educators. So this part is, has really been interesting as Tom and I have worked together. Tom is really invested in finding out the strengths in the people he works with and then leveraging those. And he has several strategies for working this in the classroom. And the idea here is how can we focus on the strengths of our children and not necessarily just look at the negative? And then when you focus on assets, what happens is now you start to change their behavior so that it becomes more productive. For example, a student who is constantly talking out in class, traditionally we might look at them and say they're disruptive. But as in Tom's mind, as we look at them and say, maybe, they, maybe they're seeking attention. Maybe they're good at this, uh, getting attention. And if we can give them the positive intention, we can change the behavior around. So again, every one of your kids arrives to school with some assets, right? So, so how we begin to identify those, because, you know, the quote that's on there now that we talked about in the book with Macri Batsari, are you able to say with clarity that every student who comes to your school, to your school's feels unconditionally accepted. Because if we have that, if we've crossed that threshold, then kids view school as an opportunity, as an invitation, not as a sentence, not as a term to be completed before they can be blessed to enter the adult world. They see the value in learning. They see the value in what we are trying uh, to develop in them in school. And so there's ways that we can begin to do this. Uh, we've talked in the past about the DNA, dreams, needs, and abilities of every one of your students. Another activity on this next slide is really quite basic. If you were to put up every kid that comes to your school, if you were to get their picture and put it up on the wall or put it up on the screen, and you gave every adult in your building sticky dots and said put a sticky dot on any student you have a connection to or be prepared to build a connection with would every student get a sticky dot now listen the point of this activity is not to create a woe is me moment not to say wow we are doing 
It's to find out, do we have every student with a significant adult at school? Do we have kids that are drifting? And by the way, it's not always the easily identifiable kids. We have some kids who have learned the game of school. They come to school to watch teachers work. They know when they need to respond in the affirmative. If teacher says thumbs up, they all do a thumbs up. Every once in a while, they look over at another kid's paper so they can call out an answer and they're playing the game. This is really about making sure that every student in your school has an adult champion. Back to the idea of the attitude and the fact that students will work harder for teachers that they respect and that they like. When Tom and I do development for schools, we integrate in short video segments so that teachers can actually see this in action. And I remember one video that we were using. There's a, it must be, it's a like a high school senior. I mean, the boy, the boy is like six foot six, 230 pound boy. And he's telling the camera how he works harder for certain teachers because he knows that they are interested in his success and that they like him. They built a relationship. And I mean, he's probably tough enough that he does not have to be scared of anybody, but at the basic level, the relationship is what motivates him to do well. So this sticky note um, activity, I've done this with some schools and it's interesting mm -hmm that they put these up in the gymnasium maybe, and sometimes they put a picture of the kids and, and then they make it their mission, those kids that don't have any sticky notes during the first quarter or whatever, we're gonna spend time focusing. They really make a marked change in, in the school culture. So obviously one of the areas that you're going to see maybe some issues emerge is the area of classroom management. And again, because children are coming from situations where they're not really maybe learning the best uh, kinds of ways to handle situations, they're going to, there's going to be problems. So in trauma sensitive schools, there's a real focus on the idea of development of common routines, which we talked about. And then the second bullet point is really important. We teach everything that we want our students to know. So we develop common routines, but we teach them. And then teachers approach behavior, not from a, you know, she's out to get me or he's, he doesn't like my class, but they try and understand what could be behind it. What could be causing this? And then the last bullet point, we really focus on getting back to that colored part of the brain versus that tan part of the brain. And we call that the rational um, part of the brain. And again, I know it's really easy uh, for, for us to say they ought to know, right? And the older the kids are, the more frequent we hear the they ought to know. Listen, if your evidence indicates that they don't know, then follow the evidence. If little Tom keeps calling out in class, it's not enough to say he ought to know. I understand that you believe he was taught that in previous years, but currently he is not demonstrating the skill. So it comes down to a very simple premise. If you haven't taught it, why are you expecting to see it? So spare us the notion that they ought to know because your evidence indicates they don't. So let's get back to our greatest cure for our greatest defense for what we are seeing that vexes us and that is teaching and during our seminars we like to incorporate some quotes because they're really meaningful for educators and this one this is kind of echoing what we've been talking about in the webinar but again a child is in, involved in trauma their brain is what we call dysregulated and you know, we take it personally. And again, it's illogical because it's not that the kid doesn't like math or that the student doesn't like you. It's because of the situation. So again, if we don't take it personally, it's easier for us to regulate our own response, which is really important. 
So in the book, we talk about uh, some steps in what we call the trauma sensitive journey. And so one of the things that we've been talking about this morning is this idea of the development, development of an understanding of trauma. And it's really important for educators to understand what is it, how could it be impacting my students, and how do I change my reaction? Then there's the focus on developing a sense of urgency. Some of you probably are familiar with the work of John Cotter. This is one of his steps. The idea that we want to make it everyone's priority, not just the headmaster or the principal's priority. Then understanding and seeing how this fits into the culture, really important. Uh, the guiding coalition, again, that's a step that we've adapted from Potter. And that's where we have to have a critical mass of people who, we can, who can keep the vision alive, who can keep things moving. It's really important that you start with a small and focused set of strategies and then build upon those. And then finally, like any good school change project, you have to upfront design the assessment and measure the, resort, the results to make sure that you're staying on course with the, with the implementation. And, 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 and just to be clear, when we do this work, we talk about a three to five year journey. And I know that that sometimes intimidates and frightens people. It's not three to five months because it was three to five months. You should have been doing it already. You don't need John or I or any other resource to get you going on that. If it's three to five weeks, it's probably not worth the investment because it won't be sustainable. That'll be rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. It's not going to really change much in terms of the outcome. So when we talk about this journey, it is indeed a journey. It's going to take some time for us to realign and refocus and get back to our purpose. Right? Because we know the steps when we start to move on this journey towards becoming trauma sensitive, trauma aware. We need to look at our attitudes as educators, as leaders. We need to help others to shape their attitudes towards this belief that this isn't temporary. As we said at the outset, trauma has been going on as long as we have been walking this planet. We know that trauma varies. We know that certain situations, the time of pandemic has exacerbated the trauma, but it didn't create it. Ken Williams and I point out in the book, Starting a Movement, right? what it takes to, ta to create this district-wide cultural change. Leadership is not a solo act. There are designated positions in schools and in regions, but leadership has to be dispersed. We need to have everybody pulling in the same direction. This is kind of back to that guiding coalition that we have in the journey where you have a group of leaders in addition to you that's actually providing the stimulus for this to continue. And then finally, you know, that collective commitment, right? This can't just be a part time. You can't opt in and opt out of collaborating. If you're a collaborator, one of two things is happening. You're either getting better or you're helping somebody else to get better. When we have a collective commitment, when we agree to function as a team during the hardest moments, if we're a team, members of a team in the hard times, turn to each other, look each other in the eye and say, we got this. Talented individuals during the hardest moments turn away from each other and try to solve for the team rather than with the team. So as Tom and I have been doing this work, we're finding that many educators also have experienced trauma or experienced experiencing trauma and stress. And so one of the elements that we try to build is educator self-care. And as you can see by this slide, 
this is the, in the red. That's the classic line when you get on an airplane. They always tell you to put on your mask before helping others. And why do they tell you that? Because if you don't survive, you won't be there to put it on for others. So this idea of we need to take care of ourselves as educators is really foreign to many of us. We work really hard to make our kids successful or you as leaders work really hard to make your teachers successful, but you also have to care for yourself. And these bullet points are really important that it can't be the last thing that you do. And again, you wanna make sure that you stay healthy so you can help everyone else. And then finally, people sometimes, they're overwhelmed by the situation and it's beyond what they or their colleagues can help with. So it's not a sign of weakness if you get help outside of your colleagues. And um, these are just three things to think about during uh, implementation for teacher and, and your own self-care. Obviously, build it into your plan. Talk about it regularly. And then finally, as a leader, take care of yourself. You model that for, for the people that you lead. We also know that it's important right, that you have a buddy system and that buddy system isn't just during times of crisis. That buddy system is just there. Someone I can check in with, you know, that, that we talk, we have gatherings, we get together, we do some different things. Um, and it's important that we plan that, right? Uh, it's also important that we make sure we're staying connected with family and friends. And as John alluded to, um, I am, I'm happy we're at the point now in our existence where we are no longer as overtly stigmatizing mental health and wellness, right? That we recognize that it's not a sign of weakness and that it's all right to get some additional support if it is needed. This time has challenged all of us and it's all right that we get the support we need in order to be the highly skilled, highly functioning educators you all are. So love this quote from Maya Angelou, right? This, this whole notion that we are on a journey, that we are all learning, right? This is year 39 for me as an educator. John has as many years under his belt. We continue to learn, right? That this is part of it. So that each time we get a chance, we get to know a little bit better. And then when we know a little bit better, potentially we can do a little bit better. It's all right to say, I don't know everything about everything, right? That's part of the journey we are all on as educators. And thank you for joining us. And we're gonna turn it back to Lauren. I think Lauren may have some questions or some comments from some of the participants. Yes. So Lauren, yes. You can, do you want me to stop my screen share or do you? Um, yeah, do you I think that might be good. Then we can see your, your two faces as you're, as you're answering some questions for us. Thank you. I've just dropped the links to the books in the chat again, if you would like to check those out. But we have got a couple of questions for both of you, Tom and John. Um, so first, um, there's a question about um, basically working in a classroom where you do have trauma impacted students who are displaying um, disruptive behavior. Um, how do you negotiate that in the moment and then uh, not, so to, to care for other students and ensure that the, the learning is continuing, but then also care for those students who are obviously needing to um, have that interaction and to take those next steps with them. How do you sort of split those dual needs in that classroom? I'll go first on this one, Tom. So I think that when you get back to one of the eight R's, which is realize, I think that the preparation being proactive is really important to think that this might happen in your classroom. And if you're realizing or looking at some of the signs, there are some things that you might be able to do to deescalate those behaviors before they get too far out of line. 
So th that would be my recommendation would be to realize this could happen, plan for it, and then notice things that could be triggering this behavior. In some cases, as much as you look out for this, it still could happen. So I think you have to assess the safety of the student and the safety of the other students in how you handle it. We found that many teachers are able to turn away or step away if something's not a dangerous behavior, let the behavior cool down and then come back to it. We found that sometimes when we've approached or teachers have approached directly, it actually inflames the behavior, causes it to be worse. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the things we've done in the books is, is to give a few uh, scenarios, a few case studies. And, and it's, it's intentional because what we have found over time is that sometimes it's really hard to talk about your class and your kids. But maybe in that case study, there's a, someone I don't know. The situation looks remarkably similar to what I've experienced, but I have some liberty now to be able to talk through and process through. And so a lot of this is also about practicing because it's tempting, right? We often say this, you don't have to bite on every hook that's presented, but some of them are really tempting. And so we want to, right? We want to make sure that kid heard us say good morning and we expect a response. And all that does, as John just alluded to, is inflame. We've now gone from a three to a nine and now it's game on, right? Thank you for the, the generous responses to those to that question. Um, we've also got um, a, a request to go through a bit of that temporary suspension of opinion again. So we've got the three stages, the listening, the diagnostic, the emotional. What does that look like for a classroom teacher? Um, so that really relates to how you ended your response to the last question, actually, Tom. And then um, what does that look then look like then for middle and higher leadership as well? I know, John, you mentioned um, sort of modelling those responses for classroom teachers, but I wonder if you could take us through exactly what that might look like for those two sets of two sets of people. I think even before we get to those, you know, one of the things we all need to make sure we do is that we have ourselves grounded, right? Uh, before we begin the interaction, um, you know, we, we've, we've shared a sentence, eight simple words. I didn't say you had an attitude problem. I didn't say you had an attitude problem. Now, if I choose to emphasize a different word, the entire meaning of the sentence changes. If I emphasize the I, I'm implying that John said it, right? And so on. As you go through that, I want you to practice that. Because if I am so emotionally charged that now I am going to try and approach the student, my meaning is lost. And if I have then invaded their personal space, and I'm a bit of a hand talker, as you may have noticed, I am, then all of a sudden we have all of this different reception of a message. All I really meant to say was I didn't. I would never say that about you. You know we've got a strong relationship, but I didn't get myself grounded. And so now I've inflamed the situation. And now it's really hard to have that suspension of opinion because now you're coming back at me and now we're in this escalation that I believe I'm going to win because I'm in the power position. But ultimately, I lose that not only with the child I'm dealing with now, but with the rest of the class who come to very quickly realize circumstances are very fluid in terms of what I say and what I do. John, something to add to that with the suspension when of opinion? We develop this skill in educators. What we try to do is put them in actual uh, talking groups and have them practice first listening. As educators, we've been trained to be problem solvers, but we have not been trained to listen. And so what we try to teach them is provide some gap between an event and your reaction to the event. It might be one second, it might be 20 seconds, but that ability to first of all listen is really key. 
And then once they have been able to listen without practicing what they're planning to say in response, they're just listening, then the diagnostic comes later. And then finally, the ability to keep your brain from going to the reptilian brain itself, you can, you can have the self-talk. So this, um, Lauren, is a learned skill that takes time. And people move at different paces through things, but I found that educators, if they decide to really stay focused and practice suspension, in about a couple of weeks, they're gonna notice that their listening skills are improved. They're solving less problems. They're able to better understand situations because they're really listening. And then in a couple of months, the listening will evolve into the, what am I gonna do next diagnostic? And then in a couple of more months, they're able to use the skill of listening to help them withhold, keep the emotion from overtaking them. So it takes practice. If we just tell you, be a better listener, it doesn't work. But again, we actually put people in groups and have them practice in a group and then they learn it and then they go back and decide how they're gonna to continue to do that. So it is difficult, but super rewarding. And as an added bonus, your spouse appreciates you even more. <laughs> For me, it became a lifesaver in dealing with all kinds of situations. I'm not going to include the spousal thing necessarily, but it became a lifesaver. Like if an angry parent came and I was able to, you know, many people come and they're just looking for respect. They're just look, looking to be listened to. Or if the district office said you have to do X and then I was able to think about it and not react. So for me as a leader, it was super important. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I think that might also slightly uh, run into our next question as well, which is um, within the, it's about the trauma sensitive school journey. So you outlined that there's also a step for selecting and implementing strategies. And can you perhaps give us some examples of strategies that you might, that a team might begin with? And it sounds like one of those is going to be to work on that really active listening and taking the time before then reacting. Are there, are there others that um, are good for beginners? We, we, I really find value in focusing on attitude and mindset. Because if we can think about our attitude towards trauma and we can develop a mindset, that's gonna inform us along the journey. So in order to change your mindset, teachers have to have an awareness of what this thing is and the impact. And it's interesting because when we talk about even something as simple as a cortisol, it's, it's eye-opening for teachers. Mm -hmm. So, because they think that they have, I guess, previously thought that somehow the student's out to get them. When in fact, they find that biologically, they may not be able to control their impulses. So attitude and mindset are important. And then routines. Again, anything we can do to make the environment predictable, those are some pieces. And then I'm going to go back to Tom. Yeah, no, you know, there, there, are, there are particular activities that we have groups engage in, but they are all towards those three areas that John just identified, right? And, um, you know, attitude mindset, it, it, it's easy to say it's not so easy to do, particularly not in the heat of the moment. I mean, when we're calm and in a session like this, I can agree to almost anything. It's now trying to project that forward to that situation where we have this escalation. We have an upset parent or an upset student, right? And, and once we start to practice this, we start to see the benefits of it. And it then becomes more and more easy to replicate. One thing Tom talked about, which I want to reinforce, is that in both books, we've included real vignettes and stories that illustrate points. And those are actually really useful. We use those as activities in some of our, our professional development work. So we give them a vignette and then we ask them to diagnose what did the teacher do, what worked, what didn't work. And people really find value in that. 
Perfect. Um, thank you both for your generous responses to those questions. I really appreciate it. Um, I think that we might be coming up to time today. So I might just share my screen, get those, those books that you were just talking about back in front of everyone. So there we go. Um, so thank you all so very much for joining us today. Um, I know it's really not easy to take time out of your busy day, whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching it later on when it is available online. Um, we really appreciate you being here um, because it does make a difference. Um, you can find both trauma-sensitive instruction and trauma-sensitive leadership um, on hbe.com.au. And we do have one further webinar as well, and that will be on Tuesday, the 8th of June. And I've got the date right this time, Tom. <laughs> Double <Perfect>. checked. <laughs> um, so finally, a huge thank you to both John and Tom for joining us today. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and as always for your very generous um, generous uh, talking through of all of the issues that we raise at the end as well. That's very much appreciated. And we really look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. All right. Bye. Bye.